This July, I was lucky enough to study in Jerusalem at the Shalom Hartman Institute. With encouragement from our temple board and the pulpit committee, with the support of past presidents and other generous congregants, I've begun an intensive three-year fellowship, which includes on-site and long-distance learning. It's an impressive group of Reform and Orthodox, Conservative and Reconstructionist rabbis, all mid-career. Most of us are from the US, some from Israel, and two from Canada. An extra gift this July was that my father signed up for the Hartman's 10-day rabbinic program. And so we walked to school together every morning and studied Torah together in the courtyards made of Jerusalem stone and shaded by fig trees, a cherished memory for both of us. The study theme this summer was nationalism. In an age of growing nationalism in many corners of the world, including in Israel, we considered both the values and the risks of nationalism, the fine line between nationalism and ultra-nationalism, the fine line between patriotic pride and then what can cascade all too quickly into fascist intolerance. What do Jewish texts teach about power and powerlessness? The ideas I wish to share with you tonight were sparked by a number of my teachers at the Hartman Seminar. Tal Becker, Michal Baton, Micha Goodman, Malila Helner, Eshed, and Yehuda Kurtzer. In the 21st century, Jews are blessed with two real homes, Israel and North America. We've never had two real homes before. For 2,000 years, there were multiple centers of Jewish life across nearly every continent. And so we took a pluralistic approach to Jewish life. But now that we are concentrated in two centers, two great centers, it seems that we don't know how to do Jewish without competition or collision. We are becoming more and more distinct from one another, living in these two centers. How do we maintain the ties that bind us as Am Echad, as one people, when our realities are so different one from the other, when we literally do not speak the same language? Tal Becker says he has the kind of Jewish mother who says, I'm cold, put on a jacket. You might know the type. He uses this as a metaphor to explain the problem with the relationship between Israel and diaspora Jewry today. Too often we assume, not only do I understand your problem because I have had the same problem, but I know how to solve your problem. For example, many diaspora Jews see how Arab Israelis are often treated as second-class citizens, how the occupation of the West Bank is untenable, and how treatment at checkpoints and borders are unseemly, and say, if Israel is serious about being a democracy, she will have to change her ways. True democracies do not tolerate such human rights and civil rights violations. I'm cold, put on a jacket. Although it must be said that now the now that America's democracy is also at risk and her own borders are disaster zones, American Jewish activists have their hands full confronting the problems right there on their own doorsteps. Meanwhile, Israelis might say, we have reason to be skeptical about pluralism and peaceful coexistence. So we will drop liberal Jews of the diaspora without a second thought and instead, we will take up strange companions like Christian fundamentalists and the rep their representatives in the government. Or Israelis see growing anti-Semitism throughout the diaspora and say, of course. Why are you surprised? The solution to the endless problem of anti-Semitism is Aliyah. The only place a Jew is truly the master of his or her destiny is in the Jewish state. I'm cold, put on a jacket. So Tal Becker calls for a little humility in this relationship. 
He urges each center of Jewish life to approach the other with more questions and fewer answers, with more respect and less judgment, with more curiosity and fewer assumptions, with more listening and less talking. One of the things that we Jews can't seem to agree on, another way that we make each other crazy, is by arguing over whether or not we are powerful or vulnerable, and to what degree. We can't decide if we are powerful or vulnerable living here in the diaspora. We can't decide if we are powerful or vulnerable living in Israel. On the one hand, in the diaspora, we do enjoy positions of power and influence, opportunities like never before for higher learning, opportunities to make lasting contributions. And on the other hand, anti-Semitism is on the rise everywhere, from Brooklyn to Iceland to Australia to Hamilton, Ontario. In the dark corners of the World Wide Web and in the light of day, too, God help us. On the one hand, Israel has miraculously become a superpower, economically, militarily, diplomatically. No matter what lies may be told in the UN, the Jewish state has earned the respect of the nations of the world. And on the other hand, Israel is under constant threat in a delicate and complex part of the world. One announcement by President Trump about US troops in Syria, and we fear Israel is dangerously exposed. So which is it? Which is it? Are we blessed? thankfully and disproportionately blessed, or are we woefully and disproportionately oppressed? We argue about it all the time, sometimes fiercely. We judge and we misjudge one another, sometimes even at the same Shabbat dinner table. One generation has the complete opposite view of the other. Often the older generation says, we are vulnerable and I'm furious about it, and the younger generation says, we are powerful, and I'm furious about it, how we will misuse this power and privilege of ours. Sometimes at the same Seder table, one wing of the family holds one view, and another wing just the opposite. One says, we are vulnerable, and I'm terrified about where it might lead. And the other says, we are powerful, and I'm terrified about where it might lead. For the sin against one another when we shout down the other's perspective, when we meet each other's fears not with empathy and understanding, but with impatience and distrust. Israel is supposed to be what unites us, not divides us. We are such a small people, and yet we can't seem to get it together. We divide ourselves up into smaller and smaller camps. We send each other articles to prove our point. Sometimes we even send articles to rabbis to prove our point. <laughs> some right-leaning, some left-leaning. Usually without much nuance, usually with a bold headline and frightful photographs for emphasis. Could it be good people, that both things are true. As confusing as it is, I believe both things are true. As entangled as the headlines become, as difficult as it is to decipher one story from the next, it could very well be that both things are true. We are both vulnerable and powerful, in the diaspora and in Israel. We are both spiritually vulnerable and physically powerful. In the diaspora and in Israel, we are both spiritually powerful and physically vulnerable. In different ways and for different reasons, of course, but it's all true. In fact, it seems that is our fate and that is our destiny. In today's world of two remarkable centers of Jewish life, both worthy of praising, we hold these two truths in healthy tension that must become a widespread and shared commitment. 
We must become skilled in knowing how to be vulnerable without putting ourselves at risk, and how to be powerful without becoming callous. This is not easy. If it were, I would be talking about something else tonight. Micha Goodman lifts up a strange mitzvah from the Torah. In Parshat Shoftim, the Torah portion devoted to the laws of judges, it is written, you shall not keep many horses. You shall not send people back to Egypt in order to add to your horses. Since the eternal God has warned you, saying you must never go back that way again. In Maimonides' 12th century law code, he drives home the point saying, it is permitted to dwell anywhere in the world except for in Egypt. It is forbidden to settle there. This is most surprising because Maimonides himself moved to Cairo. Why are we warned never to return to the land of Egypt? There are two reasons. One, because Egypt is where we were slaves, and we must never put ourselves at risk again. We are commanded never to make ourselves so vulnerable that we put our children in harm's way. We must remember the sting of the taskmaster's whip and avoid it at all costs. And two, we are commanded never to return to Egypt, even if, even if only temporarily, to obtain horses, because ancient Egypt is the emblem of power unchecked. Ancient Egypt was a great civilization that built palaces to their many gods on the backs of the underclass. Ancient Egypt amassed horses and riches while reducing much of its population to crippling poverty and denying the majority their human rights. There is a word for that kind of power. We call it idolatry. It is the kind of power which, which blots out God's name and denies the existence of a higher power, higher than the pharaohs and their courtiers. And so we are commanded by Melech Malchei Hamlachim, the sovereign God who rules over every human ruler, never to return to Egypt, where we were enslaved, and never to become like Egypt, lest we become so powerful we forget our God, or we forget that every human being is created in the image of God. Yes, we are vulnerable, here and in Israel, but we don't need to wring our hands and shry gavalt about it. The sky is not falling. There certainly are moments when we are rattled by anti-Semitism in the diaspora, rattled by Iran and her proxies surrounding Israel. But neither here nor there is Egypt. And yes, we are powerful here and in Israel, thank God. We don't need to apologize for that. But we do need to acknowledge that there are moments when we slip and let ego or ambition get the best of us. We pledge never to become like Egypt. We will remember who we are and where we come from. As it, famously, as it is famously written in our Torah, love the stranger, for you know the feelings of the stranger, for you yourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. Power ought to allow people to become more loving, not less. When one is powerful, his love can be extended even more widely. When one is powerful, her love can be expressed even more deeply. We know that with privilege and power come responsibility. Don't become like Egypt, God warns. With your power and privilege, increase your capacity to love. Show yourselves to be more loving and thereby, in God's eyes, more loved. As we Jews of the diaspora and Jews of Eretz Yisrael remain true to one another, so must both things remain true. When we are vulnerable, we will protect one another never to allow the situation to slip 
towards the dangers of Egyptian bondage. And when we are powerful, we will remind one another never to become like Egypt, worshiping our privilege, plagued by our own indifference. And with all this said, let me conclude with a third warning. We must not become a people only expert in the realm of politics. The great Zionist Echad Ha'am warned a century ago that we must not lose sight of our higher purposes. He heard and saw Jewish political debates, debates all around him. He participated in them. His, eyes, his ideas helped to spark them. And yet he warned that we must be first and foremost a religious people a people that constructs a glorious Jewish civilization built out of faith and deeds of righteousness and deeds of sacred obligation. We must be more than just our politics. We must do Torah learning and sincere prayer, acts of chesed that are small and acts of justice that are bold. Imagine if we spent as much time talking about, reading about, doing these things as often as and as passionately as we do politics. Imagine how much good we could get done. So as we contemplate our sacred calling this night, on this night of Yom Kippur, when we pull back the curtain and we peer into our future and we ask ourselves, what possibilities do I see for myself? What is the version of my highest self that I behold tonight? Let us also look carefully behind that curtain and ask, what is the finest version of my people, of the Jewish people? And how can I work to make it more so, more united, more generous, more loving? Once upon a time, the sea was split, and we, the people of Israel, marveled at your outstretched arm, O God. We will live on memories of newfound joys. Stubborn and stiff-necked, we will cling to hope. We will gather strength to fight the pharaohs when we must. We will hold fast to freedom and celebrate in song whenever we can. And we will vow that we will never be among those who are silenced, nor those who are silent. Amen.